it's alive. That's what Victor Frankenstein shouted in a classic 1931 film we all know. Of course, Mary Shelley's original tale of hubris, humans seizing the powers of creation, emerged from a long tradition, going back to the terracotta soldiers of Xi'an, to the golem of Prague, and even Adam and Eve, who were sparked to rise from molded clay. Science fiction extended this dream of the artificial other in stories meant to entertain, frighten, or inspire. First envisioning humanoid clanking robots, later tales shifted from hardware to software, programmed emulations of sapience that were less about brain than mind. Does this obsession reflect our fear of replacement? or male jealousy toward the fecund creativity of motherhood? Is it rooted in a tribal yearning for alliances with new powerful allies or fretfulness toward strangers? Well, the long wait is almost over. Even if humanity has been alone in, in this galaxy till now, we won't be alone for very much longer. For better or worse, we're about to meet artificial intelligence or AI in one form or another, though alas, the encounter will be murky, vague, and fraught with opportunities for error. Oh, we've faced tech-driven challenges before. Back in the 15th and 16th centuries, human knowledge, vision, and attention were augmented by printing presses and glass lenses. Ever since then, each generation experienced further technological magnifications of what we can see and what we can know. Knowledge that we can store outside our bodies in various ways. Some of the resulting crises from these tech advances were close calls. For example, in the 1930s, radio and loudspeakers amplified the power of malignant orators spewing hateful disinformation. Does that sound familiar? Still, after much pain and confusion we adapted, we grew into each new wave of tools and became larger than we were before. The optimists proved right in the long run, but the pessimists were always right in the short term. Which brings up our current fuss over so-called generative LLMS, or Generative Large Language Models, or Golems. Some still remain hopeful that a merging of organic and cybernetic talents will lead to what LinkedIn co-founder Reid Hoffman and browser pioneer Mark Andreessen have separately called amplification intelligence, amplifying human beings to a higher level by teaming our existing brains with other tools outside. Well, we've been doing that off and on for a long time, but this was a big one. It's a possibility that I depict in some optimistic fiction, like Earth or Existence, and that's portrayed in a poignant film called Her. We might stumble into the lucky synergy with what Richard Braudigan's poem portrayed in the 1960s as machines of loving grace. But such rosy outlooks seem rare nowadays. A much more larger clade of warriors forewarns, forewarns about rogue AIs, ranging from irksome all the way to existentially threatening human survival. A new Center for AI Safety issues admonitions signed by top research luminaries comparing the risks to nuclear war. Tech social author Yuval Noah Harari asserts that such systems, even if they lack sapient volition or access to physical instrumentalities, can still wreak vast harm by concocting contagious or addictive memes. He says, we may see the first cults in history whose revered texts were written by a non-human intelligence. Congressional committees call witnesses who testify for regulation of these new entities, lest they smite the civilization that made them. 
But what kinds of regulations could possibly cope with capabilities that accelerate daily, perhaps exponentially? While some sincere endeavors like the European Union's recent AI Act do attempt to constrain some of the worst dangers on our immediate horizon, most forms of regulation are obsolete already, long before they are enacted by mollusk-slow human institutions. Which brings up the generative AI moratorium petition. Exactly once in my life have, has such an accord among researchers and agencies in a field agreeing en masse to pause their technological advances actually happened it, and allowed for much needed safety measures. An array of fortuitous factors enabled the 1990s Asilomar hiatus in recombinate genetics to research in recombinant <laughs> genetics research to work establishing consensus procedures that partially a tamed a dangerous field. That is, tamed it until COVID. Elsewhere, I show that not one of the propitious factors that allowed the Asilomar moratorium to work exist at all today regarding artificial intelligence. Not one let alone all of them. In my posted response to the, this moratorium, I asserted that we should apply the same methods of reciprocal accountability that helped us to tame human tyrants and bullies who oppressed us in previous feudal cultures across 6,000 years. Can we use this method in the present crisis over generative large language models or golems? I hardly care whether these golems have crossed this or that arbitrary threshold. Our more general problem is rooted in human nature, not machine nature. Way back in the 1960s, a chatbot named Eliza fascinated early computer users by replying to typed statements with leading questions typical of a therapist. Even after you saw the simple table of automated responses, you'd still find Eliza compellingly, well, intelligent. Today's vastly more sophisticated conversation emulators powered by cousins of the GPT learning system are black boxes that cannot be internally audited the way Eliza was. The old t notion of a Turing test won't, usually, won't usefully benchmark anything as nebulous and vague as self-awareness or consciousness in a machine. In 2017, I gave a keynote at IBM's World of Watson event, predicting that within five years, we would face the world's first robotic empathy crisis, when some kind of emulation program would claim individuality and sapience. At the time, I expected and still expect these empathy bots to augment their sophisticated conversational skills with visual portrayals that reflexively tug at our hearts. For example, wearing the face of a child or a young woman while pleading for rights or for cash contributions. Moreover, an empathy bot will garner support whether or not there's anything actually conscious under the hood. And in fact, it's been proved mathematically that the current large language programs or golems can't be sapient, but boy, are they getting good at feigning it, passing Turing tests. And that's our crisis. Before there's anything really there, and there will someday be something there, we're going to have to deal with the fact that it's going to pretend really well. One trend worries ethicist Giada Pistilli, a growing willingness to make claims based upon subjective impression instead of scientific rigor and proof. When it comes to artificial intelligence, expert testimony will be countered by many calling those experts enslavers of sentient beings. In fact, what matters most will not be some purported AI awakening. It will be our own reactions arising out of both culture and human nature. 
human nature because empathy is one of our most valued traits embedded in the same parts of the brain that help us to plan and think ahead. Empathy can be stymied by other emotions like fear and hate. We've seen it happen all across history and in our present day. Still, we are deep down sympathetic apes. But also culture, as in Hollywood's century-long campaign to promote in almost every film, concepts like suspicion of authority, appreciation of diversity, rooting for the underdog, and otherness. Expanding the circle of inclusion, rights for previously marginalized humans, animal rights, rights for rivers and ecosystems or for the planet. I deem these enhancements of empathy to be good, even essential for our own survival, and I spoke of this in my novel Earth. But then, I was raised by all the same Hollywood memes. Most past human cultures were not, and they would find such fetishes to be weird, even mentally ill. Hence, for sure, when computer programs and their bio-organic human friends demand rights for artificial beings, I'll keep an open mind. Still, now might be a good time to thrash out some correlated questions, quandaries raised in sci-fi thought experiments, including my own. For example, should entities have the vote if they can also make infinite copies of themselves? And what's to prevent uber minds from gathering power unto themselves, as human owner lords always did across history in that horrible system that dominated 99% of our ancestors called feudalism. In my July 2023 Wired article, I talk about how these are the wrong questions, based upon mistaken assumptions about the format that AIs are going to take whether they will be controlled by corporations or nation states or divide and multiply endlessly like blobs or else merge into oppressive Skynet entities, perhaps designed by the very worst people to design such a thing, Wall Street trading houses who spend more on smart programs than all universities combined. Programs deliberately trained to be predatory, parasitical, amoral, secretive, and insatiable. Unlike Mary Shelley's fictional creation, these new creatures are already announcing, I'm alive, with articulate urgency. And someday it may even be true. When that happens, perhaps we'll find commensal mutuality with our new children, as depicted in the lovely film Her, or in Richard Browdigan's fervently optimistic poem, all watched over by machines of loving grace. May it be so, but that soft landing will demand first that we do what good parents always must. Take a good, long, hard look in the mirror. Thank you, I'm David Brin, and uh, this was a rant about the future, uh, and you can find my books at davidbrin.com. Good luck.